Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste. Today we begin a new module that is summing up and discussion. Now in this module we are going to relook what we have done throughout this course, sum up and discuss to make a coherent view about law. So this module will have four lectures, all four of them will be about summing up and discussion. So let us begin. In the first module the general principles of law 1 we had three lectures introduction rights and duties and crimes and civil wrongs in introduction we saw what is conservation and we looked at the word roots so latin con means together and servare is to keep so conservation is to keep something together to preserve something to protect something and to restore something and in the context of this course we are talking about the conservation of the natural environment and wildlife. Now you can also do a conservation of other stuffs. So for example, you can work on the conservation of natural resources. You can work on the conservation of funds of an organization. But in the context of this course, we are looking at the conservation of the natural environment and wildlife. So that is preservation, keeping things as they are protecting what is left and restoring if something has gone bad of the natural environment and wildlife. Then we saw why do we need conservation? We need conservation because we are selfish, because forests provide us with several benefits. So what are these benefits? We get clean air, clean water, stabilization of soil that is prevention of soil erosion. We get tourism and peace of mind and this tourism also leads to revenue for the people, it also leads to employment for the people. Forest and wildlife provide very good opportunities for education and research on things. Things such as carbon sequestration, things such as research on climate change, things like research on ecology, research on food chains, food webs and so on. So pro forests provide us with all of these and several other benefits. But even though we are getting so many benefits, we have already created huge losses for forest and wildlife. What are those losses? We have degraded the habitats, which means that we have reduced the quality of habitats. If a habitat earlier was able to support 10,000 individuals, now it is only able to support 6,000. So even though that habitat exists, so Animals and plants are found in that place, but still the number has gone down. So that is habitat degradation. This occurs because of things such as pollution or ghost nets or forest fires and so on. Then we have habitat fragmentation. Now in the process of habitat fragmentation, we divide a large sized habitat into very small chunks. See if you have a large sized forest and there is a road that goes through that forest. So this road will divide the forest into two smaller chunks. Now for certain animals such as the tiger or the elephant, they require large areas. And if we break up the habitats into smaller fragments, then we will have a situation that the animals will not be able to use either of the fragments. And so this will threaten the species, it will push it towards extinction in this case a local extinction. So that is habitat fragmentation, dividing up of habitat into smaller pieces. If habitat degradation and fragmentation are done at a very large extent, that is you have added so much amount of pollutants that now the animals cannot live there or you have divided the forest into such small chunks that now the elephant or the tiger is not able to use any of these chunks in the whole of the landscape or in the whole of the previous area of the habitat. 
So then we'll say that this is habitat loss. We have completely lost that habitat. Then we have led to the mass extinction of species. So this is known as the sixth mass ex extinction that we are currently going through. We have done global warming because we have spewed a large amount of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere through burning of things like coal, natural gas, petroleum and so on. And at the same time, we have also removed those things that could take away this carbon dioxide, things like forests. So basically, forests are a storehouse of carbon. You have carbon not just above the ground in the form of the trunk, the branches, the leaves and the other biomass that is above the ground, but you also have biomass below the ground in the form of the root system. Then you also have a large amount of soil carbon. You also have a large number of things that are staying on the soil, such as the pollen leaves or the twigs. So essentially, if you look at a forest, it stores a large amount of carbon. Now, when we have destroyed the forest, when we have cut the, the trees to take out the timber, when we have converted these forests into agricultural land, the total amount of carbon that this particular piece of land can now store, it has reduced a lot. So, on the one hand, we are increasing the amount of carbon dioxide, we are putting more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and on the other hand, we have stopped those processes that could take away this carbon dioxide. So, the result is that the co concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is going up. Similarly, for things like methane, methane again is a greenhouse gas and greenhouse gases are those gases that are able to trap the heat of the sun on the earth. And greenhouse gases also play a role because if there were no greenhouse gases, then in the daytime, the earth would heat up to a very large extent. In the nighttime, the earth would literally freeze or that portion of the earth that is uh, undergoing night, it would literally freeze. So the greenhouse gases play a very important role in regulating the climate. But what we have done is that we have tipped this balance and that is leading to global warming. Meaning that you have created such a huge amount of greenhouse gases that now a lot of the heat is getting trapped and it is increasing the temperature. Now this increase in temperature is also leading to climate changes. So climate change basically refers to a large or a repeated change in the climate that has occurred over a large period of time. Typically we consider periods greater than or equal to 30 years. So in a period of 30 years, if you find out that the climate has changed or the weather events have changed. So for instance, earlier you were getting say 500 millimeters of rainfall, now you are getting 800 millimeters. In a period of 30 years, if you are seeing this change or if in place of 500, now you are getting 300 or earlier the rains were distributed over a long period of time. You were getting rains over four months, but now you are only getting it over three months. Or if the extreme weather events have gone up, earlier you were getting say um, the cyclones, every year you, get, you got something like two cyclones, now every year you are getting three cyclones. Or earlier it was the situation that say every 20 years you used to get a drought, now you are getting a drought every 15 years. So if there is such a measurable change, we say that we are also suffering from climate change. And climate change in today's context is largely anthropogenic, man-made. Now, we have the option that if the temperature goes up, we can switch on an AC, we can reduce the temperature. Animals and forests do not have that option. We, are not, we have not created air conditioning for them. If there is climate change, if there is an extreme weather event, if there is a flood, then we have the option of shifting our people to other locations to save the life and property. Animals do not have that option. We have very good methods to look at the, the extreme weather events. So basically, we get a very good forecast that a cyclone is going to hit on such date and such time. And so we should be prepared. The animals do not have that. And because of all of these, the global warming and climate change have resulted in huge losses for forests and wildlife. Increase in temperatures are also leading to more frequent, more recurrent and more intense forest fires. 
So, these are all losses. Then we have led to things like ocean acidification. So, if the amount of carbon dioxide, if the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere goes up, the oceans also take some amount of this carbon dioxide in them because carbon dioxide is soluble in water. Now, when the, these concentrations go up, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the seawater also goes up. Now, carbon dioxide in seawater, it creates the carbonic acid H2CO3 and that is that has been going up. So, basically we are turning oceans slightly and slightly more and more acidic. That is again leading to huge problems for the organisms that live there. For example, if you consider the organisms that make their shells, the shells are mostly made out of calcium compounds and if the acidity goes up, these compounds just dissolve away. So, this is again another problem. We are leading to, to things like desertification, increase in the extent of the deserts. So, basically even though we are, we are getting these benefits, but still we have created situations that are leading to their losses. And these losses are going to increase with time. We looked at this equation i is equal to p into a into t. The impact of humans increases with the population size or the population density. The affluence or the amount of resources that people have, the richness of people and the technology which enables people to extract more and more resources and all of these have been increasing. And so, in a short period of time we can have a situation that there is an extinction of the species that we need. There is a disturbance of the ecosystems that we require. So, basically we will stop getting the benefits or the benefits will go down in their quantity and quality. Now, to avoid that we need to do conservation. At the same time it is our moral, legal and cultural responsibility to conserve forest and wildlife. So, this is a part of our culture to conserve wildlife and so we need to do conservation. So, this is the course on introductory law for conservation and management. So, here we are looking at why we need to do conservation. Next we looked at management which is the process of dealing with or controlling things or people. And management again is very important even in our day to day life to achieve objectives or goals to best utilize the resources optimally, to keep it going for a long period of time to get maximum benefits, to achieve the maximum benefits with the lowest cost, to establish a responsive, responsible, stable and sound organization and to prepare for the unknown future. So, we need management for all of these. And then we looked at law. So, law is a set of rules that are created and are enforceable by social or government institutions to regulate behavior. They are a set of rules. They have been created by social or government institutions and they are being enforced. So, if people do not follow these laws, they will they get some certain punishments. These punishments are awarded by the social or government institutions. And why have they created these laws? Why are they enforcing these laws to regulate behavior? So, that we live in a society that is livable. Otherwise, there will be such a haphazard society, there will be so many whims and fancies that you will not be able to lead a proper life. So, this is why we require law. We can also define law as the science and art of justice, where justice is the quality of being fair and reasonable. So, that is law. Now, different people have looked at law from different angles, each of these provide different viewpoints. So, when we say law is the command of the sovereign, we are saying that whatever the king or the queen or the government says, if they have said it, it is law, you are bound to follow it, whether it is right or it is wrong. Or when we say law is the reflection of the public opinion, it says that you that law is not coming from the sovereign, law is coming from the people. If people want something, then they can ask their representatives, they can ask their king or queen to create that law. So, the source of law is not the king, the source of law is the people. Even in our constitution, which is the basic law of the land, we started we start with 
we the people of India. So who is giving this constitution? We the people of India are giving this constitution, are enacting this constitution for ourselves. So what is the source of the constitution? It's we the people. So all of these statements are looking at laws from different angles. Salman says law is the body of principles recognized and applied by the state. So here again he is stating that the state is important, the government is important and these are being recognized and applied in the administration of justice. Now if we look at conservation and management, they are always done in a legal setting. So for example, if you are running a company, then you will have to follow a number of laws. You will have to ensure that you are paying a just compensation to workers. You have to ensure that there is no sexual harassment in the workplace. If you are using electricity, you need to ensure that all the, the laws and rules and regulations regarding electricity are being followed. So all different kinds of management activities happen in a legal setting. Even when you are managing your day to day life, you need to know the general laws of the land. You need to know that you do not have the authority to kill somebody. You do not have the authority to hurt somebody. And so all kinds of managements are happening in a legal setting. Similarly, all the conservation is happening in a legal setting. In our country, the constitution of, the in of India also talks about different kinds of conservations. Article 48A says, the state shall endeavor to protect and improve the environment and to safeguard the forest and wildlife of the country. So the basic law of the land is saying that the state shall, meaning the state has to, the state must endeavor, that is try and attempt and exert itself to protect and improve the environment and to safeguard the forest and wildlife of the country. Article 51 AG says, it shall be the duty of every citizen of India to protect and improve the natural environment including forests, lakes, rivers and wildlife and to have compassion for living creatures. So it's not just a duty of the state, it's also a duty of all the citizens and so on. Even the judiciary is saying the same thing. So the Honorable Supreme Court is saying that Article 21, which is a fundamental right, it protects the right to life as a fundamental right. But enjoyment of life and its attainment, including the right to life with human dignity, encompasses within its ambit, it encompasses within its fold the protection and preservation of environment, things like ecological balance, because without these, life cannot be enjoyed. So forests and wildlife are an integral part of the right to life. So conservation and management are done in a legal setting. And this is why we need to know about the law. Knowing about the law or the knowledge of the law is also known as jurisprudence. Juris is law, prudentia is knowledge. So jurisprudence is the knowledge of law. So we need to know law because we need it in our day-to-day -day lives. We need it for managing things. We need it for conserving our forest and wildlife. Whether we are a part of the state or we are a part of the citizens. We, it, we are duty bound to do these and so it's necessary to know about the law. Now knowing about the law answers these two questions about law. What is the nature and purpose of law? Why do we need a law in any case? How do we get these laws? What are the sources of law? Now when we look at the nature and purpose of law, why is there a law in the first place? Then there are two dominant strands of thinking. There is positive law which says a law that has been posited, that is it has been put forth is a law. And then there is natural law which says that law is inherent in our nature. So legal positivism says that positive law is the law that exists obliging or specifying some action. Very similar to what is said by the command theory of law, law is the command of the sovereign. And then Thomas Hobbes social contract theory explained that in the absence of laws, every human being will be fighting with every other human being. 
because we all are selfish we all have the, our own interests and we all want to have more and more power and so we'll all be struggling with each other we'll all be fighting with each other now if you have a society where everybody is fighting with everybody then life is not good you'll you won't be able to enjoy your life there will be a constant threat that somebody will murder you or somebody will harm you now to avoid this state which is the natural state of man in the absence of laws to avoid this state people say that okay we are going to give all of these powers to regulate behavior to somebody and that somebody is the sovereign that somebody is the king and so the king is giving us the law and the king has to be above the law and the law is the command of the sovereign so this is what the social contract theory says later thinkers have used coordination in place of conflict but essentially it's the same thing then we looked at natural law which says that there are some universal principles of justice intrinsic to human nature so being fair to others being impartial to others is intrinsic in all of us and this is also something that has been shown through different experiments so in certain experiments when you keep two apes together you train them to do something and then for the first ape if he does the right thing you give him a bumper prize something that it likes very much and to the second ape for doing the same thing you give a very small prize so in that case you'll find that there is some amount of tension in both the apes even the ape that is getting a larger amount of food which is getting what is more than its due even that will start to feel some sort of a conflict inside itself it's not because the other ape is going to beat it because they are in different cages but it is an intrinsic nature it is within all of us to be fair to everybody and so the law should follow these universal principles of justice that are intrinsic to all of us so law is coming from all of us law is ingrained in all of us and then there are two readings of natural law the strong natural law thesis says that if a human law does not follow these then it's not a law you should not be following it an unjust law is no law so you are not bound to follow it and then there is a weak thesis which says that if there is a law that does not follow these uh, universal principles of justice then we must recognize it as a defective law and we must get it changed we do not have the option of not following it but we must get it changed now national law of course has many limitations moral judgments are not verifiable there is a lack of precision and clarity there in the absence of coercive power the adherence is ineffective and so because of all of these it is more pronounced in international law and less in criminal or civil law then we looked at the sources of law we have two sources legislation that is the law made deliberately in a set form by an authority which the courts have accepted as competent to use that function that is the legislature the parliament in the state legislature and the other source is precedent the rules derived from decision or reasoning in similar situations in the past so the written law that is passed by the legislature is also known as statute now in the case of precedent the courts have created this rule that they should they are going to stand by the decided cases and not disturb established practices that is if for a very similar case the courts are giving two very different readings two very different judgments then people will not be able to follow the law and so the courts say that if something has been decided in the past then we are going to take it as a precedent we are not going to to disturb that judgment until and unless something very extraordinary happens so we are going to take or uh, take a stand that we are going to stand by the decided cases now for a precedent we have to look at the hierarchy of the courts the higher courts judgment is uh, Uh, to be followed by the lower courts that is a binding precedent but a decision from a lower court only has a persuasive force 
So the, uh, the higher courts may say that we are not going to follow it. Then ratio decidendi, a binding principle must establish a principle of law that is essential for the decision and not by the way, that is obita dicta. It must be applicable to the case, that is it must be relevant to the facts of the present case, applicable to the present case. If the present case is very different from the previous one, the precedent will not be followed and it must be valid. That is, it must not have been repealed or altered either by a statute or by a higher court with the power to overrule this decision. Then we looked at rights and duties. So, law consists of those principles in accordance with which justice is administered by the state. And these principles of justice give us rights. What are rights? Rights are something that involve a title of a source from which the right is derived, which is the de facto antecedent of the right. And with this, we get to the point of justice, ethical correctness or harmony with rules. So basically, in a legal sense, a right is a power, it is a privilege, it is a demand or it is a claim possessed by a particular person by virtue of law. Then we saw that every right has a corresponding duty. So, if there is a right, then it is the duty of everybody else to allow that person to avail the right. Then we looked at seven different views on rights, five characteristics of the right, that there is a, there has to be a person who is the owner of the right. Then if there is a right, there will be a corresponding duty that is given to all the other persons or to one or a set of other persons. Then we have the uh, content or the substance of the legal right. What is the act which the, sub, uh, which the subject of incidence is bound to do? So, what is the duty that this uh, right is entailing on others? That is the content or the substance of the legal right. Then we have the object of the right. What is the thing over which this right is exercised? also known as the subject matter and then we have the title that is through what means did the person who has this right get this right. Did it purchase the thing, did he get it as a gift, did he get it as an inheritance, was it assigned, is there a prescription and so on. So essentially there is a threefold relation, there is a right is against some person or persons. That is, others are duty bound, others are bound to do some act or omission, that is it, it asks others to do something and right is over something to which that act or omission relates. Then we looked at different viewpoints on duties, we looked at different kinds of duties, so you can have legal duties which are legally enforced, you have moral duties that are enforced by the society. You have positive duties that is to a duty to do something and negative duties which is a duty to refrain from doing something. You have a primary duty that exists in the first case and you have secondary duties if the, you have not done the primary duties. Then we looked at legal wrongs. Now legal wrongs are a violation of somebody's legal rights. So, if the rights are violated, we say that a wrong has occurred. And how are the rights violated? They are violated when somebody has not done his duty to observe these rights of the others. So, right, duty and wrong are very closely related. Now, on the basis of the kinds of uh, wrongs, we have different kinds of laws. So, we have public wrongs, which are the violation of the public rights and the and uh, the duties that affect the whole community. So, if there is public wrongs, we will have criminal law and it is charged with preventing and punishing public wrongs. So, public wrong is a wrong against the society. On the other hand, a private wrong or a civil wrong is a violation of public or private rights that injures an individual or a group of individuals. 
so this is not a wrong against the society it is a wrong against a person or a group of persons and to counter these wrongs we have the civil law and then uh, there is a sub branch of the civil law which is the law of torts which is dealing with the civil wrongs that are not based on a breach of contract so that is the the law of torts so based on the kinds of wrongs we have different kinds of laws then we saw that according to their objects we can have rights over things rights over own person right of reputation right of domestic relations right in respect of other rights rights over immaterial property rights to services and so on so you can also divide the kinds of rights based on to what these rights apply then we looked at different classifications of legal rights perfect and imperfect positive versus negative rights in rem and rights in personam personal and property rights heritable and un inheritable rights rights in re propria rights in re aliena primary and secondary rights public and private rights vested and contingent rights and municipal and international rights and ordinary and fundamental rights so these are all different kinds of rights next we move to crimes and civil wrongs and here we saw that the term crime has not been defined in in any statute so there is no written law that defines crime primarily because it is difficult to define different people have looked at crime from different angles but none of these defi definitions is very precise and fully satisfactory and so the working definition is crime is what a particular society at a given time says is a crime we looked at these different definitions of crimes then we looked at the marxian hypothesis of crime so this is a view on crime that was posited by karl marx we saw that crime consists of two uh, parts the first one is a physical part that is actus reus a forbidden deed you have done something that you are forbidden to do and there is a mental part which is a guilty mind so if you do something wrong then there is a physical act and there also has to be a guilty mind so there has to be an, an intention of doing that without that we won't call it a crime then we looked at civil law which is the positive law of the land or the law as it exists so it gives certain prohibitions for people so it says you are not allowed to do this and that and it is territorial in nature and if there is an infringement of civil law it leads to things like attachment fine imprisonment damages and other form of punishment now you'll find that a majority of these punishments are relating to compensating the victim so the primary objective is not to punish the wrongdoer the primary objective is to compensate the person whose rights have been wronged so that is the difference between criminal and civil law the criminal law deals with punishing the offender the civil law deals with compensating the victim so in the criminal law because the uh, the offense is against the society the whole society gets in the state institutes the action in the case of a civil law because a person's rights have been violated so the person is harmed the person is injured and so it will be a case of person a versus person b and so on then we looked at specific reliefs a relief granted only for the purpose of in, of enforcing individual civil rights and not for the mere purpose of enforcing a penal law so a specific relief is a relief that is granted for enforcement of individual civil rights and not for punishing somebody in india we have the specific relief act 1963 which gives all different kinds of reliefs such as recovering the possession of property if somebody has taken your property the court will give it back to you specific performance of contract you made a contract with somebody that person is now not following the words of the contract so the court will ask that person to to do what is written in, in the contract then we have rectification of instruments changes in the instruments rescission of contracts so you can make a contract null and void you can cancel certain instruments you can have declaratory de decrees that is you can ask the court 
to declare that you have such and such rights and you also have preventive rights such as a preventive relief such as injunctions which can be temporary or permanent so injunction is an order that is given by the court asking somebody to do something or to prohibit from doing something in the second module we looked at the classification of law rule of law and natural justice in classification of law we saw that the broad classification is the laws can be international or national national laws are also known as municipal laws so they are applicable within a country international law is applicable between the countries in both of these cases we can divide it into public laws and private laws now in the case of municipal, municipal laws public law can be divided further into administrative criminal and civil law and private law into things like hindu law muslim law and so on then we looked at it in more detail so international law is a body of customary and conventional rules considered to be legally binding by civilized nations in their relations with each other it, they are based on the treaties between nations then we saw that there are two kinds of law of international laws we have public and private now public international law governs the conduct and relations of state with the other states so to understand public law it's good to look at the kinds of topics they deal with extradition treaties laws of the sea laws of war refugee law international human rights law international criminal law so all of these are something that is relating to the conduct of a state with another state if there is a matter how will one state uh, regulate its behavior against other it governs the relations of states with others then in the case of private international law these are the laws that regulate the private relationships so when you say private relationships if there is a company in uh, in one country that is doing business in another country and if something goes wrong then which court will have the, the jurisdiction the parent country's court or the other country's court if some other country's uh, courts have given a judgment are you going to follow it or not and when there is a conflict when there is a case which law are you going to follow the law of the original country that is the parent country or the law where this company is now based so we have things like un conventions on contracts for international sale of goods limitation period for international sale of goods recognition and enforcement of foreign arbitral awards uh, convention on stolen or illegally exported cultural objects international treaties in mobile equipment so basically most of these laws are dealing with cases where a company is involved there are some private relationships that are involved some profit and loss is involved some matters of business are involved so these are the private international law against as against the public international law that was dealing with things like crimes or dealing with things like refugees or laws of the sea and so on now similarly we looked at the national laws here again we have public and private laws public laws regulate organization of the state functioning of the state and relation of the state with its subject so public law comprises of things like constitutional laws the constitution is the basic or the fundamental law of the state so the constitutional law will come under public law we have administrative law which deals with structure power and functions of organs of administration this is a public law criminal law the law of crimes this again is a public law then we have private laws which govern the relations of citizens with each other other varieties include things like natural law moral law conventional law customary law civil law criminal law general law special law substantive law procedural law and so on and in the case of special versus general laws we saw that section 5 of the ipc says that nothing in this act shall affect the provisions of any act or provisions of any special or local law so basically it is saying that the special laws are going to predominate over the ipc 
Similarly, the CRPC also saves the same time. Then uh, the Honorable Supreme Court in the case of Maya Matthew has propounded this judgment that if there is a special law, then it does not automatically overrule the general law. Basically, the courts are going to give a harmonious interpretation. So, they are going to interpret the laws in such a way that the meanings of both the laws, the general as well as the special law, they are given their fruits, they are executed. But if there is a case of inconsistency, then the special laws are going to predominate over the general laws. Unless of course, if there is a general law that was made later and it specifically said that such and such special laws are not going to apply. So, basically the legislature is presumed to know all the existing laws on that particular subject and until and unless they have said that we are making such and such rules redundant or we are repealing such and such acts, only in those circumstances will a later law automatically uh, repeal the previous one but not otherwise. So, that is the judgment of the Supreme Court in the Maya Matthew case. Then we looked at the rule of law. Rule of law means the restriction of the arbitrary exercise of power so by subordinating it to well defined and established laws. So, basically if the legislature has the power to do something, then it is talking about the restriction of that power by subordinating it to well defined and established laws. Similarly, if the executive is doing an arbitrary exercise of power, how do we restrict it by subordinating it to well defined and established laws. Similarly, with the judiciary, basically rule of law says that there are these three characteristics. The law has to be supreme. Nobody should be above the law, not even the lawmakers. Now, this is against what we saw earlier that law is the command of the sovereign and so the sovereign is above the law. But the rule of law says that that is not the case, the law is supreme, even the lawmakers have to follow the laws, so that is the first thing. The second is equality before law, there has to be impartiality before the law, the law cannot be favoring or disfavoring somebody and there has to be a predominance of the legal spirits. So, the courts of law must act as guarantors and protectors of the liberty. Rule of law is not the same as rule by law because rule by law says that if uh, the legislature has made something then you are going to follow that. Rule of law is not the same thing as that. Rule of law says that if a law is being made you have to ensure that it is following these three characteristics. Now, in India, the rule of law is prevalent all over the constitution of India because we are uh, our preamble starts to secure to all its citizens equality of status. The state shall now not deny to any person equality, the state shall not discriminate and so on and so forth. So, all of these articles are saying that the rule of law has to be there. However, there are certain other articles that provide for certain discriminations. In many cases, positive discrimination, special provision for women and children, special provision for advancement of any socially and educationally backward classes of citizens. So, in these cases, we are not treating everybody equally. In certain other cases, we are also saying that you cannot have a criminal proceeding whatsoever instituted or continued against the president or the governor in any court during his term of office. No process for the arrest or imprisonment of the president or the governor during the term of office. So, if we look at these articles, what can we say? Are we following the rule of law or not? Then we also have the practical issues of red tapism and corruption. So, looking at all of these, we can get confused. Do we have a rule of law in India or not? Because there is the talk of affirmative action. If you talk about a just law, now the law is there to 
promote justice and if you want justice equals should be treated equally which means that people who are disadvantaged should first be brought to the level playing field only then will they be able to exert and assert their rights otherwise they'll always be dominated so this is the question in affirmative action how do we create a level playing field so we can modify the rule of law to some extent we can say that there are certain features when we say that the that the rule of law is being followed and certain other cases when we say that the rule of law is not being followed if you have laws of prospective nature not retrospective nature that is if you have done something and later on a law is created that this is a crime so you will say oh i did not know that this is a crime because this law has been given a retrospective effect now our constitution says that the the laws of retrospective effect they will not make you guilty of a crime we have relative stability if the laws are changing every day then you cannot have a rule of law our constitution is very stable we have provided for amendments but still the same constitution has been going on since 1950 it should advance the interests of everyone the common good not only of the dominant groups so when we talk about affirmative action when we are we are supporting a group we are not supporting the dominant group but through this support we are trying to advance the interests of everyone the laws should not be substantially unjust they should not target anybody they should not violate the fundamental rights and in our case the the constitution provides the right to move even the supreme court for the establishment and enforcement of fundamental rights applied by an independent judiciary and throughout this course we saw that all the steps have been taken to keep the the judiciary independent for example once a person has been appointed a judge it is very difficult to remove that person that person cannot have their service conditions changed to their uh, losses so basically the government cannot say that okay you do this otherwise we'll reduce your salary we'll reduce your pensions we'll stop giving you the leaves so the judiciary has been protected so that the judiciary is independent there are no extraneous factors and the law is subject to judicial reviews by the courts in our country the laws as well as the administrative actions are subject to judicial reviews so if we look at these factors we will find that our constitution our systems very much follow the rules of law the supreme court in this case of kesavanandan bharti versus the state of kerala said that the constitution postulates rule of law in the sense of supremacy of the constitution so when we said that the law should be supreme the constitution is supreme here and constitution is the basic law so it talks about the sense of supremacy of the constitution and the laws as opposed to arbitrariness in indira gandhi versus raj narayan the honorable supreme court said that if you look at these three meanings of the rule of law absence of arbitrary power equality before the law equal subjugation uh, equal subjection of all classes to the ordinary laws of the land and the legal spirit that is constitution is not the source but the consequences of rights of individuals as defined and, and enforced by the courts so the supreme court said that things have changed a lot since the times of dicey now in our country the third meaning is not appropriate because we have a written constitution dicey when he wrote these for the united kingdom they do not have a written constitution so he said that the rights of the individuals must be defined and enforced by the courts in our country we have written them down in our constitution now because things are different we may not rely wholly on dicey's exposition of the rule of law and so we are going to have our own definitions now if we look at this case of uh, the honorable supreme court of india in bachan singh sher singh and another versus the state of punjab here the supreme court is saying 
it is clear that the rule of law permeates the entire fabric of the constitution so it is there throughout the constitution and it is one of its basic features meaning that the rule of law cannot be abrogated or removed by an amendment if an amendment is made and the rule of law is removed we won't call it a, an amendment of the constitution we'll say that the whole constitution has been changed it's not a small amendment so the rule of law is all throughout the constitution then next we had a look at natural justice now natural justice is concerned about procedural fairness it is a counterpart of the american due process of law the procedures must be just fair and reasonable it is applicable to judicial actions quasi judicial actions that is by tribunals arbitration panels and so on and also on administrative actions there are two principles nemo judex and res ua you should not be a judge in your own case and audi alterum partum which means you have to hear the other party no one should be condemned unheard audi is here alterum is other partum is party lord denning says that it means impartiality and fairness now if, when we talk about nemo judex in res ua this is a rule against bias because if you are a judge in your own cause you may be biased you may be partial to somebody what kinds so what is the test of bias the test is of bias is that if a reasonable man in possession of relevant information thinks or would have thought that bias is likely then we'll say that a bias is possible and so the bias has to be removed or you have to change the judge and there are several kinds of bias you can have personal bias pecuniary bias which is a money related bias subject matter bias departmental bias and judicial obstinacy so these are all different kinds of bias then we looked at audi alterum partum which means hear the other party now to give the other party the opportunity or the right to present their case you have to give them a notice the notice will tell them what are the allegations against them what are the evidences against them what are the statements against them and they must be given all of this in advance so that they can read the case they can prepare their own case they can rebut all these evidences and statements and then there also has to be a hearing now in the case of hearing the other party will bring their documents their evidences and refute say that what has been alleged is wrong we looked at uh, this case law r versus the university of cambridge and in this case it was said that even in the bible god did not condemn adam unheard but said have you not eaten of the tree whereof i commanded you that you should not eat so you have to give this notice and hearing notice must contain the time place and nature of hearing the legal authority under whom the hearing to, is to be made and the statement of the specific charges that the person has to defend against so before the hearing you have to provide him the statement of specific charges it's not that you come to the hearing and then we'll tell you what are the charges against you then we looked at fairness and disciplinary action so because these apply to administrative situations as well so even in the case of disciplinary actions if we are giving somebody a charge sheet if we are doing an a departmental inquiry we need to give clear notice right to reply legal assistance hearing without prejudice and the right to appeal only then we'll say that the principles of natural justice have been followed then we have the subsidiary principles of natural justice justice should not only be done but should manifestedly and undoubtedly be seen to be done so even if there is an appearance of bias you have not proven the bias but even if there is a mere appearance of bias it is sufficient to overturn a judicial decision because justice has to be seen to be done so there must not be any appearance of bias anywhere orders passed must be speaking orders providing the reasons for the decisions taken and the person who decides must also have heard now the supreme court has said that all the decisions have all the orders have to be speaking orders not only because the 
uh, high courts and the supreme court can then do a judicial review and for that they need to understand why a particular order was made but also because it guarantees consideration by the authority people have to devote time and resources apply their mind to uh, state the reasons why this order was made it introduces clarity in the decision making process and it minimizes the chances of arbitrariness then we looked at certain exceptions to the rule the rules of national justice may be modified or may even not be applied if there is a situation of emergency confidentiality impracticability expediency or necessity interim preventive actions and legislative actions so these are exceptions to the rule of natural justice then in the third module we looked at justice delivery the structure of courts the administrative law and tribunals and the adr mechanisms in the structure of courts we talked about the hierarchy of courts so in india we have the court in a pyramidal fashion with the supreme court at the top so we looked at the various articles in the constitution that deal with the supreme court the high court and the subordinate courts then we looked at administrative law and tribunals so administrative law is the law that determines the ends and modes to which the sovereign power shall be exercised now administrative law has become more and more important because the scope of administration has increased as we have become welfare states so basically we are now providing for a large number of things that earlier governments were not doing and so with increased administration there is increased need for administrative law then there is inadequacy of legislature to make uh, rules and laws on a daily basis or on specialized matters and there is also an inadequacy of the judiciary because of pendency of cases and in specialized matters because of which we require delegated legislation and tribunals delegated legislation is the, is entrusting the functions of legislature to the non legislative organs of the government in this case we looked at the all india services act and this one page act gave the power to make rules to the central government and the central government made so many rules and many more then we looked at tribunals which is a body established to settle certain types of dispute so they are not courts but they are adjudicatory bodies with administrative or judicial functions now in this case there are several tribunals that have been set up under different laws tribunals are similar to courts but they are different from courts they follow a more relaxed procedure you don't require advocates and so on but they need to follow the principles of natural justice and we looked at the national green tribunal in more detail then lastly we looked at alternate dispute resolution mechanisms so here we uh, saw that many luminaries including lincoln and gandhi have said that uh, any uh, that the function of the lawyer is not to uh, encourage strife but to resolve the disputes now there is a crisis in the legal system there is a lot of pendency and a way out is the adr mechanisms so adr consists of arbitration mediation conciliation and judicial settlements now there are constitutional provisions for it adr makes makes things very fast very uh, uh, very cheap it can be used at any time it reduces the strife between people it is provided for in the cpc so section 89 of the cpc says that the court has to consider whether adr mechanisms can be used or not then we looked at arbitration in which case the arbitrator gives a final and binding decision or the award as against that in the case of conciliation and mediation there is a neutral third party that helps reach an agreement so in these cases there is not the uh, passing of a, a binding award now mediation is non statutory conciliation so it's very similar we also have the lok adalat in our country so these again are adr mechanisms and we, uh, to make these lok adalat or to regulate them we have the national legal service authority or the nalsa which is based in new delhi but we also have state legal service authorities district legal service authorities and taluk legal services authorities 
So this is all what we discussed in modules 1, 2 and 3. So that's all for today. Thank you for your attention. Jai Hind.